Prelude, Polonaise No. 10 by Wilhelm Friedemann Bach. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Welcome to virtual worship at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church. We are located in Port Angeles, Washington on the traditional territory of the Klallam people. We are part of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. We seek to welcome all of you with no exceptions to the full life of this community of faith. It has almost been a year that the pandemic forced us to meet online on Sunday morning. That started in Lent last year and Lent will start again. Next Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. We invite you to drive onto the church parking lot at 12 noon for an imposition of ashes on your forehead. More about COVID prevention in the dismissal. This service will also be broadcasted on a real radio station, our local KONP, today at 11 a.m. We thank Christy Luana Baumann for sponsoring the broadcast today in thanksgiving for her mother Dagmar. If you are listening on the radio and would like to see the service as well, please go to www.gototrinity.org and two is the number two, www.gototrinity.org and follow the link that takes you to this virtual service. And now, let us begin. Gathering Him, Beautiful Savior.
Prayer of the Day. Let us pray. Almighty God, the resplendent light of your truth shines from the mountain top into our heart. Transfigure us by your beloved Son and illumine the world with your image through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Passing on the Faith Well, happy Valentine's Day. And uh, along with Valentine's Day, which is a time to be able to be able to tell other people how much they mean to us, um, in just a couple of days is going to be Ash Wednesday. And um, Vicki and I are here beginning to make some ashes that we'll be using in, uh, on Ash Wednesday. Now, now, what's Ash Wednesday all about, Vicki? Ash Wednesday is the day that begins the season of Lent, the, the season in the church year calendar. Uh, Lent is a time when we think about um, and, and take inside of us the things about um, what all the things that God has done for us. And so ashes kind of re is, uh, we make the sign of the cross on our forehead to remind us of our baptism when we became part of the family of God. And so the sign of the cross reminds us of Jesus' wonderful um, gift and sacrifice for us that we celebrate during the season of Lent. It's also a time when we think about what we can uh, also do in response back to God for that. So uh, this year we're going to be making our own ashes for the congregation. Uh, we usually do that and we usually use palms from Palm Sunday, but last year was sort of a COVID Palm Sunday and we weren't able to do that. But what we've done is to get some olive uh, branches, which is a sign of peace, and also a tree that grew around where, where Jesus lived. And uh, we're going to um, burn these uh, in here in just a second. We've got a little fire going here already. And we're also going to use some rosemary, uh, which is also a native plant of Palestine where Jesus grew up too. And it's going to be a little bit more, big word, aromatic. It's going to be smelling really, really good. And um, then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll work on this a little bit more. Shall we put a couple of these in here? Yeah. Let's see what happens. In years gone by, um, we have done this out in the church parking lot with the palms and um, created kind of a nice bonfire of things, but always in this Ooh. crazy bucket. There's holes in the bucket, too. I don't <laughs> want Dave Shargel making any jokes about that. Oh, it is smelling pretty good, though, isn't it? Oh, the fire is going well. Fire is. Can you come on up here a little bit? You can see what's going on here. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna check back with you when this is uh, when this is sort of burned down, and we'll show you what we're gonna do next. So we uh, got the fire put out. We didn't have to call the fire department or anything. It's all all done, and here's some of the ashes that, that are left. And we just uh, put them in this mortar here. And uh, I have begun to, to, to grind them up into very, very fine powder. And it needs to be really, really fine so that when you make that sign of the cross on your forehead, it's not all um, scratchy. So we're going to add just a drop or two of olive oil at a time. Very quickly it becomes a paste, and so you just don't want to have a big slurry. You just need a drop or two. There we go. To start with. And you to can always with. add more. That's always the good uh, thing in cooking, is you can always add more. It's hard to take it away. But all of this you're going to be hearing on, on Wednesday, oh, it's happening already, uh, that remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And that's really not a bad thing. That's really, as Vicki was saying before, it's in a way it's a reminder of our baptism, about how much, even at our, at our birth, and even when we pass away and go meet Jesus, we are all connected in that way. Now, later on, as we get these prepared, 
here's, we're going to be making a little a little package for you for Ash Wednesday that will be available to pick up at the church. Listen for announcements later on about how you can pick this up. We'll have a little prayer that you can have. So even if you're by yourself or with your family, you can, you can put the sign of the cross on them to tell them how much you love them, how much God loves them, even to the end. Amen. First reading, 2 Kings 2, 1-12 A reading from 2 Kings Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way to Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, because the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you not know that the, today the Lord will take up your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, because the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. And the company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you not know that today the Lord will take up your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, because the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. And Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance away from them as they both were standing beside the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to one side and to the other, until the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. And he responded, you have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted to you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two places. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 50 1 to 6. Psalm 50, verses 1 through 6. The Mighty One, God the Lord, has spoken, calling the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, perfect in its beauty, God shines forth in glory. Our God will come and will not keep silence with a consuming flame before and round about a raging storm. 
God calls the heavens and the earth from above to witness the judgment of the people. Gather before me, my loyal followers, those who have made a covenant with me and sealed it with sacrifice. The heavens declare the righteousness of God's cause, for it is God who is judge. Second reading, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 to 6. A reading from 2 Corinthians. If our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Because we do not proclaim, proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. Because it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Temple Talk, Connecting Dots. Ash Wednesday is in just three days. And it was just over two months ago we celebrated Jesus' birth. And now we begin to prepare for Passion Week and the miracle of Easter. Whew! Making our personal calendars all the more mixed up is the imposition not of ashes on Wednesday, but of Valentine's Day today. There is little to make of this proximity of a primarily secular celebration day and the sacred solemnness of Ash Wednesday, at least in the ways calendars are put together. History and calendars are made by the victors and most of us are too busy to dissect the history to see who won what. Actually, so you'll know, Valentine's Day dates to the 200s when a Christian priest named Valentine converted a Roman family and they all paid with their lives. Valentine with his head. But there is something I've discovered that might help us connect these two very different kinds of days that are so close on the calendar. Back in medieval times, it was thought that God's truths were literally written on our hearts along with the secrets only known to our beloveds. This comes from Jeremiah 31, where Jeremiah speaks of God, says, speaking for God, says, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. So much for literal interpretation of the scriptures, but that's what folks were thinking then, and focus on things romantic evolved over the centuries to its commercial popularity today. But bear with me as I connect some dots and get to the heart of things. The Latin word for heart is the basis for our word cardio, and is the basis for another word credo, which means I believe, and that's where we get our word creed. Now stay with me for just a bit longer. The meaning of to believe something has changed over time. And according to language scholars, we should really think of the word credo to mean more, I pledge my heart to, than a factual two plus two kind of thing. In a couple of days, we will hear the words, know you are dust and to dust you shall return. The mark of the cross will be smudged on our foreheads without first pledging our heart to the one who loves us more than we can ever imagine, hearing this could be really depressing. Who wants to be reminded of our mortality in these pandemic times? I'd like to close with the full verse from Jeremiah 31. It's verses 31 and 32 if you want to look it up. Paraphrasing, it goes like this. The days are surely coming when I will make a new covenant with my people. Not like the old covenant when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. This time I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts, not on stone tablets. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Do you hear the love there that God graciously offers? Hands and hearts. 
That's Valentine's language. Today, as we celebrate Valentine's Day, we rest assured in God's love for us. And the mark of that will be an ashen cross fingered on our foreheads. God's new covenant with us in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection is life-giving, not a threat for when we meet our Maker. As we make that sign of the cross on Wednesday and hear about our dustiness, let's also hear the words of Jeremiah that God will forgive our iniquity and remember our sins no more. And that is something we can pledge our hearts to. I really believe it, and I think you can too. Amen. Gospel, Mark 9, 2-9 The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Word and Art The 
transfiguration of our Lord. What an awe-inspiring event. Jesus changing his appearance, revealing divine glory, shining like the sun. It is amazing and uplifting. And yet, this time around, the scene evokes quite unusual associations in my mind. Much of my daily life happens in the virtual world now. People on Zoom can look pretty transfigured sometimes. Have you seen folks disappear into their virtual backgrounds on Zoom? Friends talking and sharing and suddenly one arm is gone, then the whole body, and after two minutes they reappear with a cup of coffee in their hands and while they break through the palms or meadows displayed on their backgrounds, they shine. There is an aura around them. And even when they sit back at their accustomed Zoom place, their appearance might occasionally change. They might freeze or flatter or a light might shine through them. These kinds of transfigurations are not awe-inspiring, but rather irritating. And yet, that is what comes to my mind when I think of the transfiguration of our Lord today. COVID-19 has catapulted us into many more virtual realities than we ever wanted to be part of. And this new virtual world changes our sense of place, self, and other. The Star Trek series Discovery comes to my mind. Virtual and impersonal realities overlap and integrate with each other. In Season 3, for example, keyboards and panels disintegrate when you touch them. And while this feels like a very startling and even disturbing feature, it turns out that they then form into the kind of interface which is most comfortable for you to use. The shape-shifting devices turn out to be helpful, but nevertheless, they disrupt my sense of reality, just like watching people walk through virtual backgrounds does. So, let me assure you, even though you are watching me on a device and my background is projected on a green screen, I am actually a real person, standing in a real place. I am recording this sermon in our studio at Holy Trinity in Port Angeles. I am facing north, and behind me is south. To my left, your right is west. To my right, your left is east. Even when we are connecting virtually, every single one of us is located in a real place, defined by an up and down and the four directions. That is a comforting thought. Many cultures acknowledge the four directions in prayers, welcome songs, and chants. The directions provide us with a sense of place, a sense of self. When placing ourselves within this universal system, we understand that we belong. Many cultures also give symbolic meaning to north, east, south and west. There is an ancient Christian tradition placing the altar in the east. That is because the sun rises in the east, and the rising of the sun is seen as a sign for the resurrection of Christ. The people enter the church from the west, the place where the sun sets and mortals live. Hence, while walking into the church from the west to the east, you are walking from mortality to eternal life in Christ Jesus. Many churches in Europe are built that way. Here in the United States, there seems to be more variety direction-wise. Holy Trinity is built with the altar in the north. More than once I have preached on the symbolic of our Jesus figure pointing to the north, leading us, guiding us, our North Star giving us direction as to what kind of life to live. Place is important. Directions are important. 
it is necessary to be situated somewhere. Our sense of self grows out of our sense of place. And then there are the holy places, these places where the divine touches the earth, places of intense encounters, of heightened connectivity. In the book of Genesis, we learn that Jacob wrestles with God all night long until God blesses him. And Jacob names the place where that happened face of God for all to remember. In the book of Exodus, God announces the revelation of his law to Moses and his people in thunder, fire and smoke and the shaking of the ground at Mount Sinai. God then reveals how to build the tabernacle, a portable holy place, to honor the sacredness of the law wherever God's people go. Places mark history. Places mark identity. In modern society, however, a sense of place cannot be taken for granted. And this problem started long before we encountered virtual reality. Sometimes I wonder, when I walk the streets of a big city, is there anything else but asphalt? Do we even sense the soil beneath the concrete? Can we still smell it? Can something grow in it? It seems impossible, but actually, maintaining a nature-free city is hard work. Roots grow, seeds break open, plants make their way in little crevices and gaps. And if left unattended, nature reclaims even the best sealed city space. Why do we put so much energy and resources into creating and maintaining inhospitable spaces? What do huge, layered and overlapping highway crossings signify to us? What do we celebrate in skyscraping towers which walls of smooth black windows? Whatever it is, something is missing. Obviously, we crave for connection with nature and beauty and sacred places. Every weekend, masses of people stream into our national parks because we crave to feel a sense of place and through and in it, a sense of self. We are a part of God's good creation and we need to feel it. And yet, the world we create for ourselves to live in systematically denies this connection with nature. When we go shopping, we buy little bits of nature, almost unrecognizable in styrofoam trays and sealed with plastic. Is this shiny pink something really the breast of a chicken? And that round, smooth veggie burger really made of beans? It seems that we are driven to make things unrecognizable, unsensual, hygienic, separated, unnatural, whatever the cost. And the cost is high. When we lose our sense of place, we lose our sense of self. We need to know our place in the larger framework of heaven and earth, north, east, south, and west. We can do this in large cities as well as small towns, in rainforests as well as zoo meetings, even in outer space. The Star Trek spaceship Discovery can jump or leap across the mycelial network, fungi network, by using a spore drive. And how does this cutting-edge technology work? By bodily connecting a human navigator to the spore drive. Physics and biology unite. Human beings are part of the process and part of the solution, and not above it or removed from it. Even while jumping through space, people are connected with the natural world. When Jesus' disciples see Jesus transfigured, it is their first impulse to build tents for Jesus, and also the prophets of old, Elijah and Moses, who appear at the scene. They are witnessing heaven touch earth, 
and they wish to mark the place where that happened. Today, the Church of the Transfiguration stands on Mount Tabor, which is thought to be the place of the Transfiguration of our Lord. And thanks to the blessings of virtual reality, you can look up this and other holy places from the comfort of your home. And while you are not on Mount Tabor, you are somewhere. I invite you to recognize the place you are at, the space you occupy. Place your feet firmly on the ground. Raise your eyes to heaven and praise the Lord. Find north, east, south, and west. Turn north to receive guidance from Jesus. Turn east in gratitude for the gift of eternal life. Turn south to express your care for creation. Turn west to feel connected to your neighbor. You are part of God's good creation. You are part of the web of life. You have a place. Amen. Hymn of the Day, Jesus on the Mountain Peak. By God's grace to share the good news, we are the hands of Christ, opened by love, joined in worship, extended in welcome, offered in service, reaching for justice. New Testament Charge You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and their second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everybody will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Prayers of Intercession this Sunday, we celebrate St. Valentine's Day, a traditional church feast going back over 1,500 years. Like anything in deeper history, origin details are weak and the festival has shifted in focus. As fickle as romantic love can be, what we can rely on is the constancy of God's love for us 
and we can be reminded of it every day in the beauty of the earth as it springs to life once more. In the loving words of our hymnody, let us pray for our world, our nation, our church and community. The King of love my shepherd is, his goodness faileth never. I nothing lack if I am his and he is mine forever. We pray, Lord, that your unfailing love and goodness will cover the earth and indwell our leaders to be your servants, never failing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We don't sing this hymn very much. It's not cheery, but how our teachers and public servants and health providers must relate to its honesty. It goes like this. All who love and serve your city all who bear its daily stress, all who cry for peace and justice, all who curse and all who bless. We pray for all caregivers and teachers who work on our behalf. They may curse at inefficiency and inadequacy to deal with constant changes and uncertainty. They are such a blessing to us in their commitment and hard work. Be with every one of them, dear Lord, in the ways they most need your care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I love your church, O God. Its walls before you stand, dear as the apple of your eye engraven on your hand. We do love your church and wish so much we could be together again within the walls of our home sanctuary. Help us as the apple, keep us as the apple of your eye, O Lord, and in the palm of your hand. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. What wondrous love is this, O my soul, O my soul? This hymn phrase doesn't end with a question mark, but an exclamation point. We pray to be confident in our prayers that when we are sinking down, sinking down, you, Christ, laid aside your crown for my soul and for all our souls. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We name before you now, silently or aloud, those who need your special love and remembrance this Valentine's Day. Let us pause for a moment. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our hearts go out to those who have no one to love them, who are stuck in unloving or harmful relationships, or have forgotten how to love through no fault of their own. We ask for courage to risk loving our neighbors in thought, word, and deed in new ways that can make a difference in their lives. All these things we ask in your Son's dear name, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, says Jesus Christ. And so, the peace of Christ be with you always. Offering. After a year of pandemic-induced social distancing, all we want is get out of our basements. We want haircuts, shopping in crowded stores, barbecue parties and church services with real people in the pews. But there's good news. Many of our congregation are already vaccinated. More get vaccinated every day. That means there is light at the end of a tunnel. The end is in sight. We will be done soon. We will get back to some sort of normal, however that will look. But we will get there. But until that happens, we ask you to open another window in your browser and navigate to www.gototrinity.org and 2 is the number 2 www.gototrinity.org and give through our secure online giving platform for all your contributions to the ministries of this church. Thank you so much. Your support enables this church to get through the pandemic to a new normal. Thank you.
offering prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, receive these gifts as you receive us, like a mother receives her child with arms open wide. Nourish us anew in your tender care and empower us in faithful service to tend to others with this same love through Jesus Christ, our saving grace. Amen. Communion Announcement Communion is usually the center of our worship experience. But this online service is not the right framework for the Lord's Supper. But we eat the bread and drink the cup every Wednesday as long as a pandemic lasts at 7 p.m. on the Zoom teleconferencing platform. Everybody who feels called to the table of the Lord is welcome. Hopefully, I see you on Wednesday. Lord's Prayer Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Sending song. Shine, Jesus, shine. Dismissal. As mentioned before, Ash Wednesday is upon us. Please turn to the announcement in your bulletins. Let me read it to you. Ash Wednesday. When you wake up on Ash Wednesday morning, I invite you to make a cross out of soap on your bathroom mirror and think about what you need to repent for at this point in time. Wash your face with water and while you do so, remember your baptism and say, I am a child of God and God forgives me. 
refreshed and forgiven, begin your day. At 12 p.m. at noon, please come to the Holy Trinity parking lot north side and receive the cross of ashes on your forehead. Park in the parking lot, leaving one space unused between cars. Wear your mask. Open your car window and wait for the presiders to come and safely make the sign of the cross with ashes on your forehead. At 7 p.m., sign into Zoom for a traditional Ash Wednesday communion service. Vicky and Don Corson will provide safely packed ashes for you to use during the Zoom service. Make sure to pick them up at church, Monday, February 15th, 12 p.m. to Wednesday, February 17th, 1 p.m. I hope that you will join us as we embark on our Lenten journey. And now, let us go in the name of Christ and be agents of grace. Thanks be to God. Postlude, Polonaise number 12 by Wilhelm Friedemann Bach.